So thank you for this great opportunity. As uh, just introduced, I am the head of the NAACP. And Jonathan and I, we met about a month or so ago at our Washington office, and he invited me to join you here this morning. And I immediately accepted, because the political landscape require deeper and stronger partnerships to resist hate. Growing up in Detroit and later living in Mississippi because of going to a school by the name of Tougaloo College, a historically black college in Jackson, Mississippi, with a history of social justice, a history that's so steep that it was the only place civil rights workers could convene and be in safety as they strategize moving forward. A, a school for me that means so much because its motto is where history meets the future. And where I can stand here and talk about all of the opportunities we've had as organizations and the victories we celebrated together, that his, history lesson is something that we can read about in a book. Because the current day reality demand us to do something even more bolder than we've ever done. The current political landscape allows for a level of intolerance that would affect all of us in this room and the membership base and constituents I represent. As NAACP, we understand clearly that when hate rears its head, it will soon be at our door. When hate rears its head, it will soon be at our door. And that's why when we began to see this conversation about DACA, we immediately filed a lawsuit. It wasn't about African Americans specifically, but we understood that Africans from the diaspora would be impacted by the DACA decision from this administration. We also understood that if we did not stand up for individuals who could not speak for themselves, who else would? But more importantly, our mission of the NAACP is to fight against discrimination wherever it exists. That's our role. That's our job. That's our mission. And I believe ADL shares that mission. It's a mission that we must aggressively pursue because our histories demand it. So you're looking at an individual who is the first in his family to finish college. Not because my relatives were not qualified or able, but because structural racism prevented the opportunities. Understanding that in a democracy, the only power we have as African Americans in this country is to organize our vote to ensure that capital don't exploit. A community with a history of being exploited for free and cheap labor, but who fought to ensure that democracy worked for all. So when I took this position, ironically one that I didn't apply for, one that I was perfectly happy being a volunteer in Mississippi, that big metropolis city called Jackson, with all of his advancement, I had a ball. But service demands so much more. Service require individuals to step up when no one else is willing to do so, or when others around you demand you do so. So I'm gonna talk briefly about my journey and hope I can connect it to our relationship. And a huge part of my journey was when I found myself being invited, of all places, to Brigham Young University. I'm a Baptist. <laughs> to speak at the law school for the er Orrin Hatch Lecture Series. So when I got the call, I didn't see it, but I thought like, what the hell? <laughs> see, if I was in a church, I couldn't say what the hell, but I could say it in this group, right? <laughs> and so I, I accepted the invitation only to be the second African-American to do the lecture series 
at Brigham Young Law School, Earn Hatch program, and, and Senator Hatch was sitting there. And so I stayed up kind of late putting together my speech and pulling it, pull it together. And my wife was laughing the whole time because I was grumbling like, what am I going to say? What am I going to say? I mean, you know, there is some history here. <laughs> you know, we don't have a tail. There's some history here. And I was flicking through television. Now, this is in 2009 after the 2008 historic election and, and Fox News was really staring up the pot. And this idiot, I mean personality on Fox News about, <laughs> by the name of Glenn Beck. And I flicked the chat on, and he had this whiteboard, he was doing this revisionist history, he was going at it. And I say, where did this guy come from? And as I re read more, I realized that, okay, this propaganda is nothing new. Propaganda has resulted in many people being killed and persecuted. And so I began to think about what can I say? And I talked about the loss of civility in our public discourse. And the loss of civility in our public discourse oftentimes reside in our media outlets promoting hate directly or indirectly. And so I constructed this speech to talk about the loss of civility using Fox News as an example, but specifically Glenn Beck. And 30 minutes before I began to give my speech, I learned Glenn Beck was also a Mormon. Why am I in Utah at Brigham Young speaking at the Orrin Hatch lecture series? And so I said to my wife, she start laughing at me. What you gonna do now? <laughs> I gave the speech. I talked about the loss of civility in our public discourse as the avenue by which hate will begin to rear its head. This is 2009. And I use an example of this religious group called the Church of Latter-day Saints. Recognize that in their reality, they feel as if they've been persecuted as well. And in that loss of civility, I also understood that there is a historic fight between Southern Baptists and the Mormon Church. Because one see the other as some type of cult. No value judgment for me, you know, I'm a Baptist. We see everybody different. <laughs> and as a result of a lot of issues between those religious denominations within the political party that they have chosen as their vehicle, there are some issues. So I begin to talk about it. And, I'm, and Senator Hatch sitting there and he's shaking his head and he's laughing and smiling. So when everything was said, was said and done, and I never said Glenn Beck's name, he looks over to my wife, he says, I think your husband really don't like Glenn Beck, do he? <laughs> and she said, well, no, he don't. <laughs> but the substance of the speech was the loss of civility. And we began to watch the gate open in ways in which resulted in Charlottesville, Virginia. Over time, how you begin, how they began to demonize then President Obama, positioning the otherness of communities, seizing upon the opportunities of fear and economic insecurity, leveraging the fear game for political advantage. And now we have 45 in the White House who've not only used the moments of the Glenn Becks of the world from the mid-2000s current, but now has opened the floodgates up so wide that in Charlottesville, Virginia, individuals will march with tiki torches, talking about blood and, and skulls. Can you imagine in this day and age People will have the audacity and be bold enough 
to display their racism so open that they will march in honor of Hitler. For the NAACP, it, it was more than a clarion call. It was a realization that elections have consequences. And because elections have consequences, we must double down our effort to ensure we participate during this midterm election cycle more than any other time. We must ensure that. That no matter what differences that Jonathan and I may have, is irrelevant when we have a whole force opposing both of us at the exact same time. And then I was in the green room, he looked at me, he said, you know, I'm much prettier than you. <laughs> and I said, you know, Jonathan, you're right. But they both, they, they all think we're both ugly. They don't think that our existence should be valued that our participation in this democracy should be honored, and that if, if they have their way, that neither one of us would be able to navigate this society in a way our children have a bright future. See, coming from histories, our communities understand what it means to be oppressed and be targeted because of our otherness. When you have media that seek to exploit fears by identifying others as the other, opening up opportunities for hate to rise up in a way in which we not only have Charlottesville, we have episode after episode desecration of cemeteries, corporate bad actors, implicit bias, all of those things germinate as distraction away from substantive public policy opportunities that will benefit this nation and our future. The midterm election is a unique opportunity for us to join together and look forward. It's where our history could meet the future. I always tell people that president, presidential election is a high watermark. People go vote, and they turn out. Not as high as we could, I think we're around 72%, some low number, but compared to other nations like Canada or Germany or Australia, it was 92, 93, 96% compulsory voting happens, right? I'll talk about that in a minute. But it's a high watermark for this nation. It's a high watermark because presidential elections, we find there is a lot of money in the process. And so oftentimes you hear during that cycle, the three months out, vote for, vote for, vote for, go vote, vote for, vote for. It's almost like Coca-Cola size ad budgets. But midterm elections is not the same. And as a result of that, the vote turnout goes down in all communities. And I always equate presidential election to Coca-Cola size advertised budgets. Well, midterm elections are like RC Cola size <laughs> ad budgets. And people simply go vote when they're reminded to go vote. See, in a democracy, the goal of the role of government should be to make voting easy, to encourage people to go vote, to open up access. <laughs> and what happens in a democracy, if it's weakened and capital controls, it exploits people and it controls the system and it results in vote suppression. And vote suppression for us for many years was, was one in which we fought in terms of implementing a Voting Rights Act. You know, Rabbi Pestner serves on our national board. Rabbi Saperstein served on our national board for many years. 
And so as I came in, I went to go vi visit Rabbi Pesner, and he said, I want you to show you this table here. This is the table where the Voting Rights Act was drafted. It's a wonderful table to look at. Because I come from the state where the evidence of why we needed a Voting Rights Act should be in Mississippi was realized as a result of many people sacrificing to ensure democracy work for everyone. Understanding that history that you had individuals who went and fought for freedoms they could not enjoy at home. World War II veterans who came back and decided they want to stay in the South and in Mississippi of all places. And they built an infrastructure and an incident happened. Emmett Till was murdered. And as a result of that, those individuals working with a Pullman Porter by the name of A. Philip Randolph made sure the information was tweeted out in 1955. Twitter at that time we called Jet Magazine. <laughs> and in that, it inspired a group of young people many of whom were also 13 years old. And when you talk to individuals who were a member of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, you ask them, why did you get involved? Because we seen the picture of Emmett Till, who was 13 when we were 13, and we knew we had to do something. Many of those individuals attended HBCUs, and they were mentored by professors. A few of them were mentored by Jewish professors professors who were able to escape Germany and could find jobs at historically black colleges, who more than any other time began to truly appreciate what democracy should look like. Along with those African-American professors, they, they sprung up an understanding of those young people that they had to take to the streets, but it had to be outcome driven which led to what we now call Freedom Summer. Now the uniqueness about Freedom Summer is that you had the activists on the ground that came from Howard University, Shaw College, Howard College at the time, Fisk College at the time, Morehouse, and my alma mater, Tougaloo. And they struggled and they fought and they had a system and a strategy led by those World War II veterans and they put it together was men and women. And oftentimes they would tell you the women led the movement more so than the men because the men sometimes got scared as the women carried the shotguns. <laughs> Winston and W. Huston, they were twins in Harmony, Mississippi and everyone knew that if you came around the little hill in Harmony, the one or both of the sisters would be sitting out on the porch with their shotguns courage. And they began to struggle and fight, and they realized that they needed to bring media in, so they recruited additional students, and many from the Jewish community heard the call. They also came to Mississippi. It's from that struggle, that opportunity, that we realize the what we see today. So as we move forward, we need to reinvigorate some of those opportunities of the past as we look towards the future, where history meets the future. Understanding that our history is only there to inform our strategy moving forward. That I am one who believes that egocentric leadership fails us every time. It's not about the best speaker, the most charismatic leader. Community-centric leadership is what would advance all of us all the time. People always try to identify who is the leader in the African-American community. Everyone is. It's like me asking, who's the leader in the Jewish community? If I say, the leader of the Jewish community, stand up. If one of y'all, if somebody here stand up, everybody look and say, who is this fella? Sit down. <laughs> there is no such thing as a leader in a movement but there is a such thing as many leaders of a movement guided by a collective consciousness which understand that hate should not exist. So as I accepted this invitation, that's what I want to impart.
that the loss of civility is something that we must reestablish, that our history is something that should guide us as we move forward, and that our organizations must operate under a collective consciousness that democracy only work if we move people to vote when we need them to vote. And if we can reestablish that, we can reestablish the principles that we all fight for. That the Charlottevilles of the world wouldn't be tolerated and we have an individual in the White House wouldn't try to walk a tightrope in saying that this was hate and shouldn't be tolerated and they should be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. That two young men <laughs> waiting in a Starbucks shouldn't be ushered out in handcuffs because they're simply sitting there waiting to have a business meeting. And when I seen those two young men, they looked just like my 22-year-old son, who happened to be in film school at USC, but every so often he won't cut his hair. And he got this funny-looking beard on his face. And he wear these, he wear these funny-looking clothes. And I tell his grandparents who complain about it sometimes, I say, I remember some pictures where you had platform shoes on. And you had these striped suits and you had the big old afro. You look funny then too. <laughs> Our young people should be free to express th themselves as they pursue opportunities. And this nation should provide opportunities to our young people so I sh as I should be the last person who say I'm the only person or the first person in my family to finish college. So in closing, I'm going to leave a story because I've bored y'all to death and I really can't see the rest of what I wrote there. <laughs> African Americans for many years who migrated from the north to the south brought many of our cultures north. The largest migration in this country you've ever seen. Individuals leaving southern states seeking opportunities in the north. So my great aunt, who's like my grandmother, she was the first to leave from rural Tennessee, West Tennessee, to go to Detroit. Because her husband, my uncle, went there to go get a job. But he got a job, but he didn't like a job because selling bootleg liquor was much better than working in an auto plant. <laughs> Wonderful after-hour joint. He, he, had, he made a lot of money doing that too, right? And one of the things she brought was Eating this substance I then thought was candy. It's called starch. I would sit under her and she would pop starch in her mouth and I was young, three, four, five years old. I bet you the brother was sitting on the wall, you know about this, don't you? He's shaking his head, yep. I can say he's a big fella, I know he, I know he know about this, right? <laughs> he would eat the starch, I would sit there like it was candy. And when I got older, I was like, why, why in the world were we eating starch? Argyle, it made no sense to me. And then I began to do some research and realized that there were times during slavery and after slavery during segregation where African Americans didn't have a lot to eat. It's called the lean months. It was after harvest, but before the planting season. There was not a lot. And starch will have this unique chemical reaction once you digest it where it would expand in your stomach. And with that expansion removed the hunger pains, giving you a false sense of being full, full, although you're starving to death. It was a mechanism of survival. It was a mechanism by which one knew that they didn't have all the provisions needed, but yet they needed to calm the pains down of hunger. But once or twice, I mentioned, like, I'm so hungry, my great aunt would get so upset, you know, have no idea what hunger is. For me, being hungry was, I didn't want to eat the beans because I wanted McDonald's, so I was hungry because I wouldn't eat the beans. I was the only child, so I always got my McDonald's. So she would eat the starch now out of habit. We had provisions then out of habit, and I would eat it, and I thought it was candy. And the sad part about the eating of the starch, people would then feel as if they were full, although they were starving to death. 
The civil rights movement, as we have benchmarks of starting ending date, if that's a thing in existence, have been over a long time now. The persecution against your community, many people feel, has been over a long time now. And for some of us, in both of our communities, many in our communities have gotten comfortable and relaxed in a way in which we don't lean into our organizations or lean into our, our collaborations among organizations, understanding that we're eating starch if we believe the rise of hatred and racism is over. When in fact, fear is the number one tool to divide people. And as soon as people seek to divide, it may be the Native Americans and then individuals from Mexico, we know immediately it's African Americans after that. And guess who's next? Could be the Mormons. <laughs> Thanks to Glenn Beck, I mean, you know. And my message here is we, we cannot eat starch as organizations, believing everything was over. This concept of post-racial society. Because what I see today is no different than what I've seen in Mississippi my 20 plus years living in that state. That the tools of fear will always be used we're seeing it coming from the White House now. I said that was the last word, but I'll give this one. People ask, well, what happened in Alabama? What happened in Alabama is you had 45 in the White House and a pedophile on the ballot, and black women turned out to vote. <laughs> That's what happened in Alabama. Because fear is something that paralyzes or propels. In Alabama, it propels. Unless we can recruit more pedophiles to get on the ballot to propel people <laughs> to go vote, which we can't do, we must be much more strategic and focus on outcomes, not only for this election cycle, but for the census next year, the presidential election the year after that, the redistricting process after that, and back to the midterm elections. Because having conversations about policy without power is nothing more than an academic exercise. And I was just asked, well, how do you do that as a C3? Well, we're C3 and C4, but for African Americans, I never have to tell people how to vote. If we get you to the polls, that power of discernment, you're gonna vote the right way 92 to 95% of the time. Followed second only by the Jewish community. So let's work together to make sure our community go to the polls. And what we have, that you may not have and what you have that we may not have, let's figure out how we strengthen each other and our weak points as we both mutually benefit for the opportunity to make democracy work in this country. Thank you very much. <laughs>